Public health officials in Massachusetts are offering advice and reassurance as a Boston man recovers from the first confirmed case of coronavirus in the state. State health officials say there are now eight cases of COVID-19 in Massachusetts. 28 cases of coronavirus in Massachusetts now has 41 confirmed cases. In a state of emergency, there are now 92 coronavirus cases in Massachusetts. We'll continue to keep you updated here on WGBH. I need to know that we are safe. I myself can't go out during the day. Wear a mask, keep at least six feet distance or even more. And there's a lot of hand sanitizer here. It just takes one person. And once it's in there, it's like wildfire. One person gets sick, everybody gets sick. Maybe the wave hasn't crashed yet. You know, that's that's kind of still what we're waiting for. You know, is that wave going to crash? Massachusetts is reporting its first recorded death from the coronavirus, a man in his 80s from Suffolk County, according to the Department of Public Health. They're the sickest group of patients I've really ever seen, and they do deteriorate pretty quickly. I can't say Ma, it's okay. I can't touch her hand. I can't give her a kiss. I can't give her a hug. I want to see my father. I, 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 I just don't want him to die alone. It's just not right. Darling, I love you. We gonna meet again on the other side. GBH News presents COVID-19 covering a slow-moving disaster. There's nothing we can't do when we stand together. That's the strength we need right now. We've been knocked down before, but we always get back up. From the WGBH Radio Newsroom, good morning. I'm Joe Matthew. With the local stories we're following, welcome to Thursday. It's 29 degrees right now. Thing is, we'll be warmer than we have been. In January is deep winter around here. And January 23rd of 2020, just more than a year ago, was no exception. Clock is ticking toward this year's 124th Boston Marathon. One of the sure signs of spring comes every year around this time. WGBH Radio's Mary Blake reports the elite fields has been announced. 75 top marathoners from 17 countries will be on the starting line in Hopkinton in April. It's a perennial story. Every January, marathon officials announce who will be running in April. This year's race, one of the most star-studded fields they've had. Mary Blake, WGBH, Boston's local... But this elite NPR. field of Boston marathon runners will never assemble in 2020. Almost exactly a year later... In January 2021, Mary speaks with Boston Marathon race director Dave McGilvray. There's no field of marathoners to announce. During the pandemic year, priorities changed. Instead, McGilvray tells Mary about his new job, organizing mass vaccination sites, including at Fenway Park. You know, lining people up at the start of the Boston Marathon is no different than lining people up, you know, at the front door of Gillette Stadium in, in our Fenway Park. Entry to Gate A will be permitted to eligible guests 15 minutes prior to their scheduled appointment times. Please have your photo ID and vaccination appointment confirmation ready to show staff once inside. Thank you. People mark the start of the pandemic differently. For some, it really started a year ago today, March 10th, 2020, when Governor Baker declared a state of emergency. GBH listeners had been hearing about the virus for weeks before that. That same January day Mary reported on the April marathon field, GBH News aired its first of what would become hundreds of reported stories about the coronavirus and its impact over the coming year. Hundreds more in China. One case has been confirmed in the U.S. We hear more from WGBH Radio's Tori Bedford. The Centers for Disease Control says the outbreak is a new strain of coronavirus, a type of virus that can come in the form of a mild respiratory infection or mutate into a deadly threat. Airports in three It was clear in the several weeks before Baker's announcement, something serious was happening. Before the end of January 2020, GBH journalists are visiting pharmacy after pharmacy, where things like hand sanitizer and bleach are in short supply, and all the surgical face masks are gone. A spokesperson for the CVS drugstore chain confirmed to WGBH News that some locations in Massachusetts are out of stock due to high demand, but they expect to restock shelves soon. Marilyn Sherrod, the state's first case of the mysterious virus is confirmed by health officials on February 1st, 2020. A student at UMass Boston is recovering at home this morning from the first confirmed case of coronavirus in Massachusetts. 
Health officials say the man in his 20s returned to the U.S. from Wuhan, China through Logan Airport last week. He then went to his doctor... All planes coming from China are being rerouted to one of the 11 airports the federal government has chosen for its ability to screen passengers. Now, these restrictions come as public health officials in Boston confirm a student at UMass Boston, who just returned from Wuhan, China, has been diagnosed with coronavirus. The fear Governor the Charlie illness. Baker says that while a UMass Boston student has been diagnosed with coronavirus, Massachusetts residents should not be worried. The risk for... Um, Coronavirus infection in Massachusetts is extremely low, and based on um, first-hand information associated with this particular individual. The virus is here, and the first long-form, in-depth local story GBH News produces about it is one of hope. As Liz Nislaw shows us, top minds are hard at work trying to protect people both from this virus and from others. It's a short walk down this corridor into the lab, but Dr. Dan Baruch knows the long, hard path to creating a vaccine. Baruch heads the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research Lab at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he's led groundbreaking work on vaccines for HIV and for Zika virus. So here we're doing a lot of work uh, in the initial stages of vaccine construction. The current vaccine target, the new coronavirus. Work here began quickly. Once Liz Nieslaus reports a story for GBH News' TV show, Greater Boston, where she visits Baruch's lab and they talk about how fast researchers can move to stop the virus with a vaccine. We don't know exactly which vaccine ultimately is going to prove the fastest, the best, the most durable or the safest, and ultimately the most effective. Liz was previously an international reporter for CNN in far-off places. But covering this pandemic is different. You know, it's it's funny. This is a story that um, came upon all of us like some sort of slow motion disaster. You know, it was like watching an avalanche from very, very far away. And you knew something was rolling down and coming maybe toward you, but you didn't realize how fast it was coming and how deep everything would be until we were all suddenly in it. In February 2020, most people in Boston aren't thinking about a pandemic or a vaccine. In fact, going into the last weekend in February, Matt Baskin reports thousands of people are more focused on the video game festival PAX East at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Back on the main floor, Megan Corliss is dressed up as Pikachu, the little yellow mouse thing from Pokemon. Like most people, she's heard all about COVID-19. It hasn't changed her mind about coming. I'm a big proponent of don't live in fear. So I, you know, be responsible, have fun. Uh, And there's a lot of hand sanitizer here. More than any other year, which I am such a big fan of. (laughs) Just wash your hands, folks. (laughs) Five weeks later, the Boston Convention Center is converted into an emergency field hospital to help relieve the overflow from the city's intensive care units. Mayor Walsh says the city is moving as fast as it can to be ready for the surge, which is already underway. The number of confirmed cases in Boston has doubled over the last week. and Mayor Walsh says the situation is likely to get worse in coming days. But he says the field hospital at the Boston Convention Center will be ready. It has a total of 1,000 beds, 500 for homeless patients and 500 for hospitals. Our goal is not to need that many. On March 10, 2020, one year ago today, Governor Charlie Baker walks up to the podium before a packed press room. So good afternoon. Today I'm joined by Health and Human Service Secretary Mary Lou Sutters and Public Health Commissioners. Baker is here to declare a state of emergency. Everyone has a role to play to stay healthy, and that's why I urge employers and other large organizations to follow our example where possible, limit or eliminate non-essential travel. Baker's declaration makes things very real, or surreal. In the coming days, lives are significantly disrupted with school closings and business shutting down. But at first... It's just rather mundane stuff that stands out. The St. Patrick's Day Parade in South Boston? It's canceled. Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks stop refilling reusable cups, and a significant amount of cleaning is happening on the tee. 
The newly announced cleaning schedule also includes daily disinfection of all T vehicles, buses, trolleys, subway cars, commuter rail cars, ferries, and ride vehicles. The Life is different on the roads, too. In general, the amount of traffic recorded on most major roadways in Massachusetts is down by about 68 percent. The state DOT. The day Baker declares a state of emergency, GBH's Kirk Carapeza is on the radio describing what's happening on college campuses. On an unseasonably warm day before spring break, students sunbathe, reclining in yellow and blue Adirondack chairs scattered across campus. Senior Shannon Donahue from Manchester, New Hampshire, is recovering from the flu. Despite the flaccid scene here, she and her classmates are freaking out about coronavirus. Especially on like social media, like you go on like like Twitter or Facebook or like TikTok and it's just so many like jokes, but also all of these kind of like Oh my God, like this is happening, like buy your face masks, like wash your hands. Security expert Juliet Kayyem says we're facing what she calls a slow rolling crisis. Something like a pandemic is probably the hardest thing to rally and galvanize around. The reason why is because there's not the proverbial boom. Uh, that moment, the Boston Marathon bombing, a hurricane, an earthquake, uh, an oil spill, that people can organize and motivate around. Emmanuel College sophomore Gabriela Rico says there's nothing the schools can do to prevent an outbreak on campus. All share saliva, all share the same air, like we're all Bathrooms, basically the same person. Yeah. One person gets sick, everybody gets sick. What colleges quickly figure out they need, they can't get. Tests. For the next several months, the issue of testing and how to fix it drives a lot of news coverage. As health experts trying to figure out how to get more people tested for the coronavirus. Testing is one of the big ways out of this mess. It's a way to bring back some semblance of normal life. Require more test kits and is now arranging with the Broad Institute to use their state City of officials told to WGBH News Tuesday they're installing tents outside two major city homeless shelters that will be used for testing and The city will try to find 1,000 people willing to be tested for the virus and be tested Somerville's for the free COVID testing site where any city resident can schedule an appointment by phone and then drive... My doctor sent me to the ER to get tested, but I couldn't. There weren't any tests. This test is a nasal swab. Anyone who thinks they might be ill needs to start on the phone with their um, doctor. Or the all right, nice job. Get your up all right, bit. yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yep, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right, you should hear something in two days. If you haven't, there's a phone number on the form to call. Okay? Wow. Okay, great, great. They really go up there, but... It's not that bad. Massachusetts Water Resources Authority has been sending samples three times a week to BioBot to test for COVID-19. The company has employees returning to the labs in waves and only after they've been tested. Until a vaccine is approved, testing shows the most promise to keep people safe. Testing, hand washing, and social distancing. But even after Baker's declaration, not everyone is into staying six feet apart. The coffee shops are mostly empty, the pizza places too. But at the Irish pub, The Burren, the room is packed, the beer is flowing, and a bagpipe band is marching in. Social distancing isn't on the menu at the Irish pub the weekend before St. Patrick's Day, and Matt Baskin hears all about it from people outside the Somerville pub. Apparently I feel really guilty about it, but... Uh... I don't know, I guess, just deciding to have fun with friends over the greater good of the public, which, as I'm saying it, sounds terrible, and I should probably go home right now. But uh, are you? Heck no, we're getting drunk, baby. You want to come? Baker hears these folks, too. He's having none of it. That Sunday morning, March 15th, Baker issues an emergency order that prohibits eating and drinking inside bars and restaurants. The order goes into effect two days later, on St. Patrick's Day. It's the first holiday impacted by the virus. And for many people in the months to come, the holidays are the hardest time. With society shutting down, families are compelled to spend more time together. But visits to grandparents and other relatives are cut back. Or in the case of senior care facilities in the state, ended entirely. As the COVID-19 pandemic widens, it's people over 70 who are most likely to die. That simple fact is making many elders heed what the State Department of Public Health is telling all of us to stay home. With the isolation comes fear and uncertainty. As WGBH Radio's Marilyn Sherrod tells us, all the turmoil and changes have led to high stress and anxiety levels. Dr. Marnie Chanoff is a psychiatrist at McLean Hospital in Belmont, widely known for its mental health treatment programs. Chanoff says in times of uncertainty, 
people become anxious. There's a sense of danger. There's a sense of, you know, lack of control. Anxiety is to be expected in these kinds of conditions. So if you're anxious, you have to know you're not alone. It does help to talk about it, she says, and share your feelings with others. Julie Elpis Anxiety about the disease only grows as more people get sick and tell their stories. Consider the case of 50-year-old Wilder Jean. He's a long-term care worker. He tells GBH's Chris Burrell about being on a ventilator and put into a medically induced coma. I was very complicated. Uh, I ended up with acute renal failure. Uh, the hard thing is you, you wake up every day, you don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be a swollen foot? You go through all that. You still have times when you're so fatigued you don't want to get up. Jean is one of more than 7,000 long-term care workers in Massachusetts who got COVID, and at least 26 of those workers have died, according to federal and state data obtained by WGBH News. And, like Wilder Jean, who is black and Haitian-American, the majority of frontline workers getting sick in long-term care homes are people of color, many of them immigrants. Anxiety and uncertainty aren't just for grown-ups. When mom and dad get sick, the children feel it. When the schools close in the days after the emergency declaration, the children feel it. I was actually excited the first day I heard it, but then I realized being like cooped up in a house for three weeks and having to deal, like help my like siblings and listen to them complain about every little thing. Reporter Craig Lamolt speaks to families at a park in Leicester. Another parent at the park is Caroline Regulus of Worcester. She says her three daughters are doing school lessons at home. What do we do? Math, science, we did reading. Art. We art did art. Reading. Yeah. Her six-year-old Josephine is clear on one point. I want to go back to school. As people try to stave off loneliness, boredom, and anxiety, some are forced to deal with the pandemic in a different way. They lose loved ones. WGBH Radio's Marilyn Scherer has this story about death and dying and the search for comfort in the midst of the pandemic. The last day Lori Baudet saw her dad alive was Easter Sunday. Her dad died two days later, and she couldn't be there. Everything with this COVID crisis is just awful because everything's different. Like, you can't have, like, a normal wake and funeral. You just can't grieve normally. And you can't even die normally, you know? Visitors are barred from senior living facilities. And funeral homes across the state have been forced to alter wakes and funeral services. All of it impacts how we grieve and how we comfort each other. For Father Thomas Washburn of the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption in Fall River, that's the most heartbreaking part, the lack of comfort, and it hits every faith. The sight that is in my mind and in my heart over and over again is just the many people that I've seen that are just sort of crying almost literally inconsolably, right? They're, they're crying at the loss of their loved one, and no one can come near to console them. GBH reporters begin a series of stories about people who have died from COVID-19 called Lives Remembered. Reporter Soraya Wintersmith speaks with the grandson of Boston resident Jerry Williams, who describes a video of his grandfather's 82nd birthday party. You sing happy birthday. It's your birthday. And you know we don't give up. It's not your birthday. Hey, 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 hey. And it gets real quiet, and all the candles are lit on the cake. And we're like, make a wish for your daddy. He's like, I wish that all my children and my grandchildren before they pass becomes a millionaire. Woo! And everyone starts screaming like the Oprah show. Ah! It's hilarious. Beautiful, beautiful memory. One day after church, Jerry started feeling achy. Then he developed a persistent fever. Michael Sr. took Jerry and Bobby Joe to the hospital together. Even with his father's diabetes and high blood pressure, Michael thought he and his mother would both eventually return home. But only Bobby Joe was released. Jerry Williams died from COVID-19. He was 85 years old. Soraya Wintersmith, WGBH, Boston's local NPR. This is WGBH Radio. The most serious COVID patients are put on ventilators. Many don't come off them before they die. For others, the breathing machines give patients a chance to recover. During the first few months of the pandemic, 
there's a shortage of ventilators and not enough respiratory therapists to run them. A WGVH News survey finds in all five community colleges in the state will graduate about 60 therapists this spring. Many of them could find themselves on the front lines of this pandemic. The pandemic is particularly challenging for frontline hospital workers. One nurse speaks to GBH reporter Marilyn Scherer a few hours before going into her overnight shift at St. Elizabeth's in Boston. I'm frightened, honestly. I know it sounds dramatic. I'm frightened. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to do this. I will. I'm 60 years old. My children are grown. I, I would go into work no matter what. If I get sick, I get sick. I wouldn't blame people. I wouldn't blame nurses if they didn't go in. In addition to all the medical people, the home health aides, and the people working in senior care centers, people with no relationship to medicine or social services find ways to help, too. For some, a simple gesture, like going to the market for an older person and not putting them at risk, can be life-saving. On the Saturday before Mother's Day, we find Belmont's Anthony Vodo at a star market shopping for his in-laws, who are in their 80s, and a friend in her 90s. It's imperative that the village takes a, a, a step and remember that it is a village and you have to help those that are elderly or infirm. Somebody still has to eat. There needs to be the hunter and the gatherer in a family or, or, or any village. I'm that person. Throughout the pandemic, supermarkets are often packed with people, but in short supply of things like toilet paper and non-perishables like pasta and freeze-dried milk. One of the other places where people get food, the restaurants, many struggle with the new realities that come with capacity limits, changes in hours, and shutdowns. Some restaurant owners say regardless of what the governor decides in the coming weeks, social distancing rules will prevent them from serving enough customers to make money. Matt Marini, a manager at Troquet Restaurant in the Leather District, says his business can't afford another shutdown. I don't know what will happen if we have a winter without, you know, no restaurants, because the amount of people that this industry employs is astronomical. Restaurants begin to reopen in mid-May, but for many families, restaurants and takeout are not an option. In July, 16 percent of the Massachusetts workforce is unemployed, the highest in the country. Food lines become more common. Captain Kevin Johnson oversees one of the Salvation Army's largest food pantries in Lynn. He says before the pandemic, he would handle between 70 and 90 families a day. Now he tells WGBH News he's seen close to 500. It's not the normal people that we would see in a food pantry. It's people that have had jobs and because of the quarantine have lost work. Underserved communities are getting hit the hardest, with the highest case numbers and the greatest need for resources like food. Gladys Vega is a community organizer in Chelsea. What can I tell you? I probably get like 15 to 20 calls a day. Uh, people asking it for food. If you want to see my porch right now, I probably have 70 boxes of soup and macaroni and cheese. At 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, I'm just going to call my neighbors and stuff and tell them, hey, I have soup here. Come and pick up whatever you can. In May, people in Boston and across the country react to social injustice and the killing of people of color by police officers. They take to the streets, putting themselves at risk for the virus because it's important. An infectious disease specialist at Mass General Hospital is urging demonstrators to continue protecting themselves from the virus during the protests. Dr. David Hooper says he cannot stress enough the importance of keeping six feet away from others and wearing face coverings in public, both inside and outdoors. The virus really uh, doesn't care that, you know, you uh, perhaps don't want to do this. It will be a substantial risk for a long period of time. But somehow, even with all the strife and fear and uncertainty, people still find ways to engage and sometimes even have fun now and again. Members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra were on stage yesterday at Symphony Hall to record a one-hour video be available online next month. GBH Radio's Mary Blake reports it was the musicians' first time performing together since March.
It was an emotional reunion, according to BSO president and CEO Mark Volpe, who addressed the group on stage. It's actually hard to get through, a, you know, just a welcome. Okay. And those on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic right here in Massachusetts got an aerial salute today from the 104th Fighter Wing of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. Four F-15 fighter jets flew over several hospitals just afternoon, going from one end of the state to the other. National When the kids go back to school in September 2020, many never leave home. Most students receive some instruction online. Some students, like many of their parents, do all their work on Zoom, a video conferencing program most of us never heard of before the pandemic. The students tell GBH reporters they're concerned they'll fall behind during Zoom learning. Some people right now, they're just, since it's on Zoom, they turn their camera off and turn their mice off. Some people are like, yeah, no, I don't know if I can do this for the whole year. And I agree, like, it's really hard. Everett High School student Anne Laurie Pierre starts her first day of school in September fully remote at her desk in her bedroom. She speaks to GBH's Christina Quinn as part of the newsroom's COVID in the Classroom project. And when that first day of school was over, it was clear from her video diary entry that her morning enthusiasm had waned. Today was really hectic because, um, I don't know, I just don't like the idea of sitting in my chair for 75 minutes long. In mid-December, GBH host Joe Matthew shares some good news. The first vaccines are rolling. In fact, some of them have probably already arrived at their destination. This is an historic day. The first COVID vaccines will be administered in the U.S. likely today. The vaccine arrived in record time, and the GBH News audience was kept informed about its development, its delivery, and all the steps along the way. Residents and staff at nursing homes and assisted living facilities will be given the first round of COVID-19 shots with boosters to follow in another three to four weeks. Medical and essential workers wait in line, standing at least six feet apart. They roll up their sleeves and get jabbed with the needle, carrying the vaccine. Teachers were recently pushed back in the state's timetable for vaccination, but now the CDC says the shots are not required. A steady tick of newly vaccinated patients trickled out of the center after getting their shots. Massachusetts is one of just eight states making the COVID-19 vaccine available to prisoners early in the vaccine. She's the associate hospital epidemiologist at Tufts Medical Center. She says they've only wasted eight doses out of more than 21,000. The state-run hotline for coronavirus vaccination appointments will launch later this week. That's according to Governor Charlie If you've been Baker. having trouble getting a vaccine appointment in recent days, today could be a good opportunity to try it again. Massachusetts ranks 36th in vaccine distribution among the states with only about 7%. There were warnings well before a vaccine for COVID-19 was a reality. Worries about whether traditionally underserved communities would get a fair share. Let's call it a vaccine buddy system, meaning anyone who accompanies somebody 75 or older to a vaccine site can get vaccinated too. By late February and early March 2021, things are changing. A post-Christmas surge begins to ease and daily case numbers drop. The state's color-coded metric of each community's risk of infection goes from a high of 229 cities and towns in the red to 19. Concert venues will be able to open at 50% capacity with a maximum of 500 people on Monday. Mass General infectious disease specialist Dr. Mark Seidner says recent COVID data supports Baker's decision. I think we've actually earned ourselves a bit of freedom, you know, the chance to go back to restaurants and events again. And I really think we should savor that. Reopening sports stadiums and other venues that seat over 5,000 people will begin March 22nd. Today, at the one-year anniversary of Baker's March 10th, 2020 emergency declaration, Massachusetts is reopening. Thousands of people are getting inoculated each day. And as we've been reporting, there's reason for hope. Sean Corcoran, GBH, Boston's local NPR.